Okay, uh, welcome back, all the participants to Digital Futures. So tonight, this is good evening, all the participants from Asia and Pacific uh, time zone. And the good afternoon, Patrick from Europe, from London. And also we have some special uh, friends coming from the States. So that's really early. So welcome, join us to um, Digital Futures 2022. So the theme this year is One Planet. So we're looking forward um, to uh, calling people, participate all the lectures, events, and make some discussion on the technology and future and rethinking on the ethical problem. So how would, uh, shall we address our uh, research practice and our thinking to the One Planet, this certain topic? So this is uh, the whole plan. Actually, we're in the workshops. So originally planning uh, the uh, the this course should be during June the 13th to the 24th. But based on the uh, the the very intense schedule of Patrick's, um, uh, he is traveling. He was traveling last week, so uh, moving to this week. So every day we will have a special lecture uh, at night in uh, Asian Pacific time zone, and Patrick will give six lectures in the next six days. So uh, looking forward, we have a, a closing ceremony on July the 3rd, and we will announce Digital Futures uh, 2022, the awards uh, uh, at night of July the 3rd. Uh, so welcome, join us. So this is uh, like the participants this year. We have uh, more than 7,000 participants from different continent and participate more than 100 uh, workshops. So they're from Asia, uh, North, South America, and from Europe, Africa, uh, uh, Australia, so on and so forth. And these are the workshops. Uh, we, you can see the increasing number of workshops all over the world. This year, we have 132 workshops, more than uh, 300 uh, instructors participate, teach different, uh, different uh, workshops, different topics. And the most special of this year actually is the uh, language channels. Uh, we have 12 uh, different languages coordinated by uh, uh, different um, um, uh, digital future hubs around the world, and including English, Chinese, Spanish, Portuguese, Arabic, uh, Turkish, Japanese, so on and so forth. So um, uh, we're going to localization. As, uh, on the one hand, uh, the global technology and uh, the world around uh, um, prominent professors, practitioners, like Patrick Schumann coming to give us lectures that is totally global knowledge system. But at the same time, we go to uh, different uh, linguistic channels, which is totally uh, local uh, events organized by dig different digital future hubs. So we we're sharing the platform like Patrick's um, uh, lecture to all of you around the world. So you can check everything on the platform of Bilibili, YouTube, um, and the uh, different metaverse platform like uh, Crystal Voxel, um, Decentraland, we have different uh, metaverse space, also live stream the lectures. So these are the three courses we actually organized by Tongji and contribute to the world, uh, including the architecture philosophy, architecture theory, and uh, also the architecture design methodology. And uh, we're lucky to invite, uh, it's a great honor to have uh, Patrick Schumann here to give six lecture. I think it's like a review and also uh, and we're looking for, forward to see what Patrick is theorizing architecture discipline, uh, which should be extremely uh, attractive to all of us. And at the same time, we also want to announce just uh, launched a new journal named Architecture Intelligence. Patrick also contributed a very important uh, um, uh, article on the inaugural issue. So you can check the website and uh, the right button and Springer uh, 44223. And uh, right now, uh, because a very intense schedule, we have three articles already online. And in the next month, uh, the other nine uh, articles will also come in uh, very soon. So the first week of the PhD consortium invite uh, Daniel Wallagen, Matt Thompson, Richard Lee, and uh, Anthony Picon and uh, Isla Berman gave seven lectures uh, for the PhD consortium. And the last weekend, uh, 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 we actually organized the Young Scholar uh, Symposium uh, and, and invited different expertise and, and the also practitioners uh, and the researchers. They gave a different topic and uh, all the young scholars. 
And last week, we have also another seven lectures, including Matthias Campo, Maria Capo, and Kumo, uh, Lam Yang, Peter Chuma, uh, uh, Imro Ko, and uh, Jack Wu. They also uh, uh, give us uh, fantastic seven lectures. So today, I think uh, the first lecture from Patrick Schumann, and the topic will be a new framework for architecture. I think it's a subtitle for the autopoiesis of architecture, the, the first, the volume one. I think uh, that's probably a brief review and also uh, looking forward, what's the new framework of architecture uh, from Patrick Schumann, uh, he theorized, he would like to theorize the framework uh, for architecture. So I would like to briefly introduce him, uh, although everyone know him, but I think um, we still need uh, to introduce Patrick Schumann to uh, everyone. He is uh, uh, he joined the practice in 1988 as a designer and become the close collaborator and office partner of the late uh, uh, Hadid. Through the course of over 30 years, Patrick has been the co-author of the firm's definiting uh, projects, including uh, Max uh, 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 Max Plus, Max 10, 10, and, and the National Museum of uh, the 21st Century and uh, Arts in, in Rome, and also including uh, the uh, uh, Heather uh, Aryan Center in, in Baku, and also uh, the, the um, Circle they, uh, their, uh Bridge in Abu Dhabi, and also um, uh, the Domino uh, Design Park, the King and um, Adelu uh, Hochelum Studies and Research Center, Gary Sohu in Beijing, and uh, also the City of Dreams in Macau, and uh, uh, also the Sohu Beijing and the Dash International uh, Airport of Beijing, I think, as well. So his education background, also his study uh, uh, with the University of Sugat and with London South Bank University completing his architectural diploma and receiving his degree from Stuttgart in uh, 1990. He also, uh, I think he's a student of um, um, very important uh, Stuttgart professor for your auto. And that's uh, very interesting uh, uh, showing the, the academic relationship from Patrick to, to the academic world. He also studied philosophy in London and the Bonn receiving his uh, doctor degree from Institute of Culture Science at University of um, Klangenfurt in 1999. Patrick has been teaching at various uh, architecture schools throughout the Britain, continental Europe, and the USA since 1992. And since 1996, he has been the co-director of Design Research Laboratory at the uh, AA uh, School of Architecture in London. And he very famous for his uh, AADRL. That's like uh, uh, a big army, uh, which he educate uh, to the office and also to the world. And uh, he co-taught a series of postgraduate uh, optional uh, studios alongside uh, Jahadid at the University of Illinois in uh, Chicago at Columbia University at uh, Harvard GSD. Uh, Patrick has also taught many years with University of Innsbruck. And his contribution to this course of contemporary architecture is evident throughout many published works. Uh, I think uh, uh, we know uh, 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 very famous uh, uh, parametricism, uh, the autopiosis of architecture to volume. That's extremely important to the academic uh, study and uh, uh, a lot of reading reference to all the graduate and PhD study. Uh, I think the project's experience actually, he. Um, remain involved in uh, uh, a lot of the uh, uh, design works as a principal for Jaha projects and with an active role in his development throughout the all design stages. He is a chief designer on every project that we undertake. So today he gave a framework of his uh, lecture, I think the new framework for architecture, including the theory of architecture poiesis as a comp comprehensive unified theory, and also architectural system of communication and functional uh, casual explanations inside descriptions versus outside descriptions, the theory of architectural autopiosis as the dominant specific super theory, the historical differentiation emergence of architecture 
necessity and function of architecture theory. I think uh, most of the researchers are very familiar with this part, but we actually want to um, invite Patrick Schumann to, uh, 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 to make this special, uh, special lecture to introduce his uh, new frame for architecture. Let's give the screen to Patrick. Welcome. We're looking forward to six fantastic lecture. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Philip. That's a very generous and long introduction. That's wonderful. And it's amazing to see the whole scope of Digital Futures this year, the expansion into that many workshops, that many lectures, events. I mean, it's fantastic. And also the language channels. Uh, channels. It's really remarkable. So I must congratulate you and Neil and the team to push, push this out there. Fantastic. So I'm very proud to be part of this and to be given that <clears throat> nice airtime of uh, leisurely, you know, I have a lot to say, but six lectures, is obviously, there's a nice space to fill. So, so that's fantastic. So I don't know I'm, how long I'm going to uh, talking before the uh, Q&A, but it might be an hour. And um, then I hope we can have a conversation about this. Um, this can be more of a seminar in the end than a lecture, I hope. I mean, I suspect the PhD students will come in and 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 confront me with their questions. So, um, well, great. So let me try to share my screen because I do have, I don't have images, but I have some text slides, which always helps to, <clears throat> to make maybe notes and as an aid memoir for me to structure the lecture. Let me see if I, <clears throat> one second. Okay, one moment. Share screen. Ah, here we go. That could work. Okay. Yeah, it's an ambitious program for me. Um, I start with this. I mean, uh, uh, the theme of uh, One Planet is great and the, that we're getting into some ethical issues as well. I'm up for that. <clears throat> That's not the way I've been framing my theory primarily. <clears throat> but one thing is for sure, architecture, <clears throat> like any cultural endeavor and discourse, is inherently, that's nearly in the DNA of any discourse, public discourse, and, and architecture is one of them, to contribute to the common real, which means to progress for all, and that means the planet, because we architecture is world architecture. Architecture is, of course, a discipline that has knows no national boundaries, and it's a global discourse. <clears throat> so the way I would frame it now, <clears throat> it wasn't in the original book, I didn't start like that, but I think it's important that we step back and you're talking about the planet and the overall, let's say, human project. Um, I want to talk about freedom and eman emancipation and how all discourses are part of that. It is, it is really the same thing as developing the common wheel because I think freedom is something every sentient mobile creature uh, requires for survival and therefore also desires and internalizes as something. And the lack of freedom is always causing frustration, but also a danger potentially. So, uh, but I want to distinguish material freedom, which is the increase, increasing liberation from the material necessities and impositions of an indifferent physical universe. On the one hand, from the social freedom, which is the increasing liberation from the necessities of social discipline imposed by our cooperative conquering of material freedom. Okay, so the basic condition obviously is that we're struggling collectively to survive and we should cooperate. And that's the way we have generated that enormous prosperity. So what I call material freedom, we could, we could also call prosperity. And what I call social freedom is liberty. And oftentimes <clears throat> they, could become in, they could be in conflict with each other <clears throat> to the extent that 
um, that to conquer that universe, we need to cooperate, which requires a certain amount of self-discipline and also cooperative discipline and organizing in the social process. But oft oftentimes in the history of humanity, um, there was the necessity actually to emancipate and generate more individual freedom and degrees of freedom because the uh, we were locked into maybe older and ancient forms of um, co co cooperative coercion, which which could now be broken, breaking of the fetters. Uh, so so there's also a project of social emancipation, oftentimes. <clears throat> but the primary primary agenda must he be here: material freedom and the degrees of social freedom, which are conducive to that. We need to discover in a social political discourse, let's say. <clears throat> and in terms of the material freedom, which is possible to conquer, their technology is a lead. Technology is really charging ahead and, and opening up space of possibility, which we then also need to discover um, which social arrangements are now under new technological conditions, um, the best way forward to make the most of free freedom. And freedom is simply just that liberation from the necessities of this universe and to make it a, domesticate the universe, if you like, make it a, <clears throat> a pleasurable and comfortable uh, uh, home for everybody. And yes, that's, that's our planet. And of course we have also a lot of, you know, ecological conditions and the risks and dangers to confront as well. But I've, my main pitch here is progress in terms of productivity gains, in terms of prosperity potentials are required also to solve these ecological problems. I've just, by the way, uh, there will be an article coming out very, uh, very soon on the issue of ecology and my pitch for voluntary um, action and, uh, you know, degrees of freedom required to make that e ecological project real. <clears throat> so, so that's where I'm starting. Um, basically with Marx or his historical materialist criterion of progress this is the increases in economic productivity. And of course, this is to a large extent technology, but also of course to develop technology, you need certain social conditions like science to be uh, in place <clears throat> and productivity increases are uh, require certain social arrangements to be fully to allow this to fully flourish. But these uh, social conditions are not always. Um, I mean, they are tough social scientific questions. What are the the best conditions? But we have we can, should never lose sight of um, economic productivity, economic growth. And by the way, this is not only uh, the range of products and services we now understand and know uh, to make them more efficiently produced with less time and energy, et cetera, but also of course, continuously the generation of new products which make life easier and, and elegant and pleasurable <clears throat> and productive. So here is something which I, I want to start with before I go into the detail of my particular understanding of where architecture and the, let's say the built environment and architecture's role within the built environment fits into that overall trajectory of human progress. Before I come to that, I want to step back and reflect on this meta argument or meta position, the position about positions, uh, how one positions oneself. So what, what I've been advocating is what I call the imperative of convergence. So I believe that the discipline must strive to define a shared paradigm and its agenda, its direction. That means the best way forward for architecture, for the built environment to fit in with the best way forward for world society, et cetera, global progress. 
I mean, that is just, of course, is not something which comes easy and one can unit, unilaterally declare. <laughs> but this is, I think, what um, the spirit should be when we enter a global discourse that we are hoping to find convergence consensus because when it comes to enacting um, agendas and recipes, and that's ultimately the only justification for investing in theory. Theory isn't la pola, isn't uh, you know, an intellectual uh, pastime for its own sake, but all theory is directed towards or is, is meant to guide action, innovation, and charge, charting a path. And a lot of times, in particular in architecture, we have to plan and invest a lot ahead of time. And, and, and we are in charge of huge, irreversibly, let's say, invested resources. So, so it is, it, it's very important to have strategic dis debates. And that's where theory comes in. <clears throat> that's not always sufficiently reflected. So the purpose or end game of architectural discourse is consensus around a shared paradigm as a precondition for cooperative cumulative progress to, towards a global best practice. So that simultaneous or sequential acts do not contravene each other. I mean, that's the point. So if you're trying to develop a city of, for the 21st century, a certain urban processes, um, <clears throat> at least in each city, we shouldn't have, you know, highly contradictory trajectories and interventions, which in a way obstruct each other, um, get in each other's way. Um, I mean, if as long as we haven't resolved and fully debated out the pros and cons and the best way forward, yes, that is what we're going to have. But I think the horizon of a an attempt to find a um, collective movement, I think that's very important. And I think we had that in architecture. Uh, that was actually the, the usual condition. Uh, that's the normal condition of architecture, at least um, let's say I can talk primarily about the Western world, but China also had its period and had its coherency of an approach to architecture and built environment across the empire for centuries. And in, in Europe, you obviously had um, the great epochal styles, uh, which, which started maybe in, for instance, the Renaissance was started to fit in with the early uh, <clears throat> city states and early capitalism and trading uh, city states uh, who made a lot of progress on, on many other fronts as well in terms of science and 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 business etc so so we had the renaissance which then started to you know ramify out and migrate out and take over near defining something for the first time like the architectural discipline and then migrated out into uh, mo across uh, most of europe and then when we the shift uh, to the next stage of development into the baroque for instance was also rather universal uh, uh, and, and all encompassing movement where the arguments and, and and the examples and paradigms of the baroque took over from the renaissance i don't can no detail of this so so and the same would would apply to um neoclassicism which aligns with the bourgeois revolutions starting in in france but migrating out as well and modernism of course is the great story of the 20th century so it's this idea of a coherent approach where um, <clears throat> the built environment um, and the discipline of architecture leading and guiding the formation of the built environment fits well in within a, a, an overall project of human progress is very important for, um, I think, the civilization. Of course, it seems that today we have lost this. Uh, we have been fragmented and broken into these very many different approaches and the pluralism approaches. And uh, it seems as if the contemporary world is too complex to allow for that, but I, I don't believe it. We, we are also trying to find in some kind of best practices in other domains, uh, in, the, the, in the domain of politics, in the domain of you know, political economy and ec economics, in the domain of, of uh, you know, health and, and, and medicine as well, et cetera. So 
I would say the um, the, the, the uh, celebration of pluralism is as an end state and permanent condition is I think uh, highly problematic. I mean, the celebration of pluralism in a state of brainstorming in a stage of transition when the next stage of development is uncertain. And that was the case in the late 60s, early 70s throughout into the 80s uh, <clears throat> and what makes a lot of sense. So you, 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 there you have an unhampered and you would and should see an unhampered brainstorming and bringing out of various positions and possibilities and imaginations. And then there was gut should be that, that um, uh, thinking that through weeding that out, probing that, trying that out in various projects and debating, keep debating it, to weed out and find what, what's the best way forward from all these, let's say, new ideas. So I think that accepting of pluralism can only be a temporary historical condition during these periods of crisis-induced paradigm shift. So the 1980s are paradigmatic for that. <clears throat> uh, and then this one, I'm reckoning with temporary divergences and a temporary pluralism of direction. So when I was a student, actually, in the 80s, that was when I was an architecture student. I mean, it was like this. So, I was, you know, there were so many different uh, things which were simultaneously tried. And one, there's new things coming up, it seems, every few years. So, you know, I was studying in Stuttgart, which, you know, with a hardcore Miesian modernism. And uh, that, which then continued into something like, you know, the work of Norman Foster, that was very strong in Stuttgart. The same time you have your Frey Otto, which is a very visionary and different approach, uh, in, in not these kind of rigid grid and crystalline structures, but form finding process inspired by nature. So that was something very different. You had, at the same time, you had the eco ecological movement starting very strongly, and you had an, a very strong investment into the idea of smaller self-sustained settlements, and timber construction, etc. But also, what we had, uh, what arrived in Stuttgart in the 80s, was postmodernism, of course, with a vengeance. And you had James Sterling building actually one of his masterpieces in Stuttgart. And we had, um, uh, you know, we were reading postmodernist polemics in uh, seminars that came actually in the, into the school through the, the time, through the um, uh, descriptive geometry and, and, and uh, discipline or institute. So, so and, and then we, 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 we started to see the, in the late 80s uh, postmodernism breaking up into you know, uh, various branches uh, with neoclassicism coming in and, and real serious historicism versus the pop collage uh, conditions. And then we, the emergence of deconstructivism. So it was really a, a, a roller coaster of divergent attempts to see what, what's the next stage. And at the same time, I was looking a lot at Archigram at, uh, and also dystopian vision, super studio. So it was very, very diverse, very diverse. But then what was fascinating for me, and that's why I come to this position, the, the idea of convergence, when we moved uh, in the, into the early 90s and we started to absorb computational uh, processes of design, we also uh, uh, absorbed intellectual currents coming out of complexity theory um, as well as inspirations through the work of Deleuze Guattari, who picked up a lot of the complexity discourses and brought them into philosophy. We, what emerged there was a new sensibility, which late, you know, years later, I retrospectively called parametricism. It started with so-called folding in architecture, but this folding was just one particular formalism, which allowed these new paradigmic conditions to emerge of you know, continuous differentiation, gradients, field conditions, a lot of these great topics, which I think uh, became topics of parametricism. So for me, that was an experience of convergence because it electrified everybody of my generation at the time. And I witnessed this both at the AA, but more strongly at Columbia University, where the whole school moved in this direction. 
And then it also infected other schools like SIAG and GSD around that time. So the early 90s, the her first, most of the 90s were this amazing uh, experience of convergence, the movement where literally everybody who has been doing all sorts of different things. I mean, I see it from one year flipping to the next. Um, um, when we had so many different things and everybody dropped what they're doing and jumped onto that very strong movement. So I think for me, that is, was a, a very important historical experience. The problem is that this didn't pull through all the way. And um, although it made enormous of progress and we have you know, figures like Philip Johan and, and Achim Menges and Zadid Architects and many others who, and, and large projects around the world who who following this trajectory, it remained overall in the overall discourse marginal. So, so I think that's why I'm thinking there's a lot work to do to bring it to full um, fruition because really we need um, at least a majority, a critical mass of uh, researchers, but also practicing architects to come in and help and make these new, uh, I would say superior ways of working the new best practice. And then also, of course, industry will invest much more rapidly and much more pervasively in these processes. And the whole thing will take off uh, wonderfully, uh, comparatively the way modernism took off. I mean, it also took a while. It was started in the 1920s and, and it was only in the 50s when it, when it really spread around the globe uh, fully. So I think what is important is um, I call it benign intolerance, where meaning that one is, is never an ad hominem, it's, it's always um, an attempt to understand where people are coming from and see the rational kernel in various position, but, but ultimately seeing that goal of convergence and this meaning that that one is challenging. One isn't, one isn't, let's say, letting go. One isn't say, okay, you, you, you do yours, I do mine. Let's be nice to each other. Let's be polite to each other. And um, uh, let's all have do our own thing in our own little niches. I mean, that's what you find too many, too many times. <laughs> that's uh, this. So this is the, the, the principle which I reject is the principle of indiscriminate tolerance. And again, it makes only sense in this post-crisis phase of brainstorming, which I think is the 1980s. It doesn't, it, it wasn't so much the case in the 1990s and it re-emerged re in the 2000s and full on only since 2008, where we, where we lost our nerve with respect to the pushing progress forward. And there was a lot of confusion and disarray and, uh, you know, and, and, we have uh, we are now back into a, in a situation where we we don't as a discipline we ha we have no trajectory no uh, leading position no shared paradigm and I think that's the problem because that means that the discipline cannot really make much of an impact on the development. It cannot help shape, shaping, uh, you know, rapid urbanization, it cannot help shaping um, urban transformations, um, the way buildings should be, uh, become more, more intense uh, hubs of communication, et cetera. We, we can only do it with, with, you know, individual isolated interventions, which, if they don't get the full backing of the field, then they also, the, the society of large will not, will remain confused and will remain uncertain about uh, which direction to follow, who, who, which group of architects to, to hire, et cetera. And yeah, I think the, 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 the practical necessity I mean, in the end, it marginalizes the field. The field has no voice because it is too fragmented, basically. That's what my argument is. Um, 
And again, the historicizing argument is this, these discourse cultures are not absolute, but must be reflected and adjusted in line with historical junctures and tasks, meaning that this pluralism, that uh, laissez-faire approach to anything, let you know, is that, is the way you start when a pa old paradigm, maybe the basically the paradigm of modernism, uh, was bankrupt, uh, like, you know, it is, it is the same uh, problem where, where some of these highly nationalized economies, that idea of central planning, of mechanical mass reproduction, uh, based on a central plan, these were no longer viable. And so these processes, social, societal, economic and political processes, which modernism was well fitted to and technological processes, they have been radically shifted and changed. <clears throat> and if you look at the, uh, let's say breakdown and of the um, Eastern Bloc, uh, Eastern European versions of communism, that those those forces were the same forces which also so in a sense killed and made modernism impossible so and the initial um backlash against modernism came through these iconoclist mavericks inverted commas like the you know the the the, the postmodernists and even the, the and the deconstructivists also, but I think to to showing ways to being inspirational uh, do sparks to 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 generate new trajectories. But then we need to move in and develop things through cumulatively, and we need to build large organizations again. So the big iconoclasts initially they could be very small studios. Um, and discovering new uh, possibilities for architecture, but then to roll them out, we need to build, you know, disciplined sets of arguments to not only be seen as a curiosity, a spectacle one could use for a particular curiosity of a building or a particular cultural building, but that these are principles of built environment development, which can be uh, generalized. So we need to basically, that's the argument here, um, to reach that position where we get back to having a pervasive impact on the transformation of the built environment we need to first kind of get our house in order in the discipline. And that means increasing the polemical force and insistence and weeding out ignorance in the face of by now mature and compelling set of best practice principles. So we have to heat, we have to be a bit more assertive and this could also be strong backlash. We all need to be learning from each other. And, but what should not be the um, option here and a, what shouldn't be a respectable option is just to pull back and say, hey, um, let me do my thing. And I don't think that should be celebrated. I don't think that figures who do that would, would, should be icons of our field. So that's the question of a discursive culture uh, where we have peer pressure. I think that's the only way forward. Um, so what we need is that cumulative mature research and development under the auspices of, and my proposition is of course, the auspices of parametricism, tectonism, uh, the full utilization of uh, computational intelligence, uh, also the full utilization of the computational intelligence that has been uh, revolutionizing the engineering disciplines. <clears throat> we also need to bring in uh, the new technologies to 
uh, simulate interaction processes and occupancy processes, life processes in, in complex urban environments. So we need to bring in all these um, uh, tools and systems and generate a much wider repertoire, um, optimization processes, evolutionary processes, and in the end, that leads us to the endless forms of nature, to a great variety of and a greatly expanded solution space. We need to also be able to not only to search, but also to, to, to have tools of evaluation. And this needs to become the best practice. I'm very convinced of this. Now, the counter arguments would have to be made, not just you know, ignoring and continuing you know, let's say backward path that we shouldn't, that shouldn't be tolerated. I mean, of course, no, there's not going to be any force um, a, a involved here. It's just discursive force of the bigger argument, but we need to be willing to make that. So that's what I'm pitching for. And in a way, we need to be, we don't need to be shy. We don't need to be overly polite. Um, I mean, what we're looking at with, in terms of parametrism, of course, while this didn't expand to become a, a hegemonic epochal paradigm the way I, it, it, I thought it would and should be, hasn't happened yet. We need to, um, yeah, we need to, I think, be more assertive, more probing, and call out um, projects and colleagues who think that they can work in ways which maybe are unchanged from, for instance, 80 years ago. So a lot of what's going on now in the built environment is not sophisticated, is, has very, very standard templates, um, very, much based on routine application of very old recipes. And if, if that's taking place, we really have to wonder is why is architecture a academic theory-led research-based discipline at all? It, pr it probably isn't for most of what's being built if it's still built in that backward fashion. So in a way, what we're having is not a discipline, academic discipline. We have an, a, a craft, we're having a form of apprenticeship in, in many offices where, where you, you, you just learn the tradition of how to approach a brief and how to lay out and stack a bunch of uh, let's say spaces, um, no, with, with no different from um, 80 years ago, 70 years ago, 60 years ago. Basically, we have a large part of the discipline not seeing the, the innovation potential of more sophisticated methodologies and more versatile and, and adaptive morphologies, um, the efficiencies of more sophisticated structural system, the lightness, the ability also in, on technical front to integrate um, environmental concerns and have much more um, light-footed and adaptive differentiation uh, of, of the envelope facade set of with respect to environmental condition. Now we, we, have, we have all these projects which have very, very standard serial repetition, as if uh, maybe sometimes there's postmodernist decorations, but really just a craft. And that needs to be challenged and called out. So, stepping back now and looking at more particularly um, at the way we have to argue for our new framing of, of architectural theory and architectural agendas. 
I mean, architecture has emerges as a discipline together with architectural theory. That's precisely it. Um, architecture emerges, and that's what I've been saying, architecture as a discipline uh, commences in the Renaissance with the work of Alberti, then inspiring, of course, the works of many others like Serlio and Palladio, and then it moves over into France with uh, many other um, architect theorists. So it emerges together with, in, in out of a craft. I mean, architecture up to then was just this craft. And that's why I call uh, it a tradition bound building. The Gothic is an interesting uh, high point in this craft condition, but it's a, maybe it's a transitional episode. But if you look at the Romanesque and all our previous styles, they're just vernaculars. And we're talking about tradition bound buildings. So we really have to realize that architecture proper, where we actually also have authors, architect authors and writers taking responsibility for the innovations they represent and argue for is what we now understand to be architecture. So we can now read Alberti, we understand somebody like Alberti or Palladio as our colleague. That's the same self-conception of somebody who is um, seeing themselves as an innovative original author of a work of architecture who can, you know, argue for the features and innovations and qualities. And that's precisely what Alberti showed, the man of letters who got into it, into architecture. I mean, coming out of the Florence the Renaissance, um, there were premonitions like this with people like Brunelleschi, of course. And you had competitions. So we, 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 we emerging architecture here. And, and Alberti is the key figure who has a full, fully fledged theory of architecture so precisely because things are radically different and new. You can't rely on them being understood, condoned, and taken as given like you would in a craft edition. You have to argue, you have to explain what you try, why you changing things, why are you doing something different? That is also the society surround clients, audiences, they all require obviously an explanation. That's why, that's why architecture must come along with theory as well as with the, for the first time, of course, with a full design medium, like a full set of drawings and perspectives. Now that still continues. So we, we in particularly at the moment of innovation, when the new challenges and opportunities come into the built environment, we get this, this, this kind of intensification of architectural theory and research. And, and of course, the, 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 the huge um, new challenge, well, one of the big challenges was um, the bourgeois revolutions, the, the 19th century, where you have a lot of theory coming out, a flourishing of architectural theory, you know, looking at the work of uh, Durand, for instance, his lectures on architecture, new methodologies of design, a new combinatoric of, of generating ver versatility and variety in compositions with all these new building tasks coming up of uh, university buildings, museums, ministries, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, but much more dramatically and radically uh, when we come to the, uh, you know, turn from the 19th to the 20th century and we have the emergence of modernism and it's totally pre prefigured by architectural theory through the works of people like um, Friedrich Naumann, uh, Otto Wagner into Adolf Loos uh, and, and many others who have been uh, writing and anticipating, calling for a radical shift in the repertoires and ethos and of architecture together with the, um, the new, the, the new um, tasks which emerge in, 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 in an industrialized society, which started to emerge, in particular since the socialist revolutions or the post first world war, 
revolutions in uh, all the most and many European countries, including the, uh, in Russia, meant that there was an enormous amount of, you know, transformation and architecture stepped up and you have great debates and a rapid convergence and uh, a flourishing of theoretical discourse as well as experimental design discourse, these fantastic schools like the Bauhaus and the Wutemas and many others, movements like the style. So that's what we're looking for. And, and there was actually an enormous, a fantastic convergence and also a lot of weeding out. There was this pluralism at the same time. You had the Art Nouveau, you had Expressionism, you had Neo-Historicism and uh, different directions within say within modernism and in the end uh, there was this kind of very strong convergence which you can pin to its you know to the key, the key three uh, figures like Gropius, Mies and Le Corbusier for instance. So that's for me the the example and the theory of uh, a theory of in of modernization at the time um, was underpinning modernism and you can see that in, in the writings of Le Corbusier um, towards new architecture in the city of tomorrow, we have, it's a clear recognition of the industrial civilization, the industrial city, industrial processes, transforming architecture, you know, a, in a, a focus on, on uh, performance, on functionality, according to the mass uh, mechanical reproduction systems, which were emerging and were showing the future. So again, um, and I think that the next big wave of transformation into a new global socioeconomic political civilization was actually happening in the 1980s. So we are, myself, I mean, not the students, you're born into the new era. I was kind of uh, coming of age, uh, you know, just entering, you know, becoming adult, 18 years old when when we hit the um, we hit the 1980s. So I felt it very very strongly and realized, and looking back, I realized that this was this period very similar to the 1920s, let's say, um, or you know, let's say um, 1980 is very much like 1918. I mean, we got after the big, um, let's say. Um, economic crisis of stagflation of the 70s and the transformation into a new, uh, what is called the neoliberal revolution. These are just the political expressions, but the, the underlying technological transformations, of course, is the convergence of um, computational cap capabilities and systems with telecommunication. So, this is an enormous transformation, of course, and the built environment architecture has to has to a, a address these issues that led to the collapse of modernism. Modernism wasn't a mistake; it was just would have been a mistake to continue because we we shifted into a totally new um, socioeconomic uh, dynamic and technological world, and that needs to be represented. So that's where we have to start. And when we're talking about architecture today. We are still in that period. I call it, you know, post borders network society that has a technological base, which is always the real agency in history is technology. But it, of course, then calls forth a whole series of cultural transformations, uh, you know, of course, economics, uh, transformations of, you know, of social relations, of individual life projects, individual self understandings. Uh, personal identity conditions, everything radically changes and architecture has to deal with this, has to pick that up. And uh, that's why, you know, there's a, architectural theorists are called upon, of course, as well to, to help, to, to see what's going on to, and in, the, in, those, in those transformative movements, let's say if you take, a, take the deconstructivist movement, you do always have these two casts of characters of the kind of intuitive geniuses, let's say Frank Gehry, Zadid, Rolf Pricks, who, 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 but they work together in the, in the group with this, with the thinkers, people like Ram Kohlhaas, Bernard Schumi, Peter Eisenman. And, and there's, there's a whole set of theorists floating around and, and there's a lot to be absorbed 
a lot to be uh, overcome in terms of simplistic theory of modernization. And so I'm also, you know, what happened in, in philosophy, the post-structuralist, let's say, uh, revolution in intellectual life, all of this came together. And, but, but so this is after, in a sense, that, that that 80s and certain ways forward become clearer we also can go back to a a a, a social theory a theory of society of social development which is not the critique and undoing of modernization theory and modernism which you'll find maybe in a derrida or is the playful let's say magicians of new algebras and inspirational concepts, the Luz and Kateri, you can't go to these people to, to find a new um, profound grounding of architectural theory going forward. That's where I'm looking at candidates for a, let's say post post-structuralist, build up of a sophisticated um, theory of society that would um, have incorporated all the lessons from let's say post-structuralism and, and, and the seeing the new dynamics that's where i'm going to figures like luhmann hayek habermas and there's a few other mentioned here giddens Goff, joffman latour and, and Delanda is also one of those. I think Delanda is interesting, in particular interesting because it's also joined the discipline of architecture teaching at um, Sayag. And he's a, he's a self-taught philosopher of history, of sociology and socioeconomic dynamics, has written some, some fantastic books, uh, Assemblage Theory and, this, and the New Theory of Society. These works, I'm just mentioning him because he's we were quite familiar with him. And he also obviously was fully endorsing um, working with computational methodologies and is in a sense, a protagonist of on the theoretical side of parametrism. That's why I also was happy and proud to invite him to contribute to parametrism 2.0. Um, so I think it's very important that we have that theoretical grounding to defend and also to think through um, the next stage of development for architecture, I mean, which has been in gestation, I would argue, uh, throughout the 80s and the, in the 90s, we found new ways. And most of the 90s were spent in working through and elaborating and making it practicable and interfacing it with, with um, uh, constructability issues and engineering issues. And then I called out, you know, Permacin 2.0, in recent years or to focus on the societal functionality uh, of and art types of argument for this paradigm to be pushed forward. So that we really understand not only that it is we can do it, but why are we doing it? And why is it important to do it? And you can see in many, um, many urban conditions driving spontaneously into the direction of course of complexity of layering of interpenetration of of opening up of porosity of continuous flows all of these themes are spontaneously happening to some extent and then you have uh, you know few firms like google and the big companies they you know they instinctively realize what is congenial you know the, that's why they're hiring let's say facebook is hiring frank gary and google is hiring Heatherwick and, and, and Biaki, and they're doing kind of parametrism um, project. I think these are very important hints that we are on the right side of history. We just have to push it through. And it's a shame that, that it remains a, an embattled, isolated, misunderstood um, trajectory in our discipline. So, These are just some of the, the thesis. I mean, I'm also including the other design disciplines, by the way, and that's important because now we're talking about the metaverse and in the sense, which is a new form of web design and virtual communication design, which will be part of us. And I think architecture, architectural firms and architects are perfectly positive to take this on. Um, so it's not only um, 
architecture and urban design, urbanism, it's also interior design, furniture design, fashion design, all the, the design disciplines, the totality of the phenomenal world needs to be brought under the spell of these new dynamics, uh, which focusing in on intensifying communication, collaboration, and for that, we need to navigate a, a complex social space, which also includes the space of self-expression through fashion, through, through, through um, the way you dress up and generate atmospheric differentiations, differentiations to different social institutions and social offerings in the urban environment, uh, real or virtual, et cetera, et cetera. So I think all of that is implied in the concept of permetism. Permetism isn't very, is something very, very open, Basically, um, that's why I also insist on defining it to some extent negatively is it's basically, we have to leave behind everything which history evolved up to that point. So there is no collaging like in postmodernism. There's no serial repetition like in modernism. There is <clears throat> no kind of preconceived forms in which you stuff everything like symmetry and proportion like in, in, in traditional architecture. It is everything generated out of a much more sophisticated tracking of complex social processes. And it's basically what I was love, <laughs> what's amazing about this, like the endless forms of nature and it is optimization process, form finding process. That's why I call it throughout to the only true precursor of parametrism. And now that it's later stage tectonism, of course, is learning much more from for Otto because we are not, we are learning to have pre-constrain this technological, um, and engineering and material conditions a lot of these form finding and form generative processes which makes them all the more legible all the more characterful and uh, full of uh, opportunities to associate the institutions with particular identities that is all is all very, very potent and powerful and uh, it is tied into something which i elaborated in volume two which is for instance the um, the semiological project the phenomenological project Etc. And now I'm talking about the dramaturgical project about making things interactive, adaptive in real time, etc. So what is very important is that we develop, first of all, present this as a huge opportunity for creative participation, not something which is a narrow channel. It's not like uh, you know a, a style in a very restrictive sense. It's a paradigm in the sense of opening up um, a vastly richer space of exploration than all previous styles put together. And yet there is a recognizability, there's a sense in which we can still, even though they're so vastly diverse and with so many original contributions, we can quite quickly and instantly sense and see and and understands with our supercomputer that that is a version that it this is parametrism or tectonism. It's a bit like you're able to see the difference when you look at the a morphology. You, you you kind of understand that's an organic creature. That's some plant or animal or something in between. And that's part of organic nature as with respect of inorganic nature. You can quite readily distinguish those. I mean mostly or that is something man-made something technical mechanical versus something organic a living creature and they're even though they are you know millions of very very different and diverse organic creatures what they call the endless forms of nature you instantly can sense where it belongs to and, and so that recognizability as something that belongs to the style of primatism doesn't mean that it is kind of all the same it's just that contrast is what all the parametrism creations share. Uh, however diverse they are, they share that stark contrast with anything, for instance, modernist or postmodernist. And I think that's, that's actually very important and powerful because that means it also it's important for later on for aesthetic sensibilities when the designers as well as general public, we can instantly spot whether something has at least the paradigmatic preconditions of being either participating in the hyperfunctional world of um, let's say parametrism tectonism. No guarantee. Of course, you can do a lot of creations which are dysfunctional in that world, 
And therefore we need to be precise and we need to be rigorous and probing and testing. And we need these simulation and testing algorithms in terms of not only structural and technical, but I'm talking social functionality simulations, what I'm working on, you need those to find the, not only the, the, uh, the solution which, which shares these morphological features, but that these features are actually well calibrated and uh, a, a, a geared towards the particulars of a situ social situation of an urban district of an institution. So, I mean, of course you can make um, dysfunctional versions. All I'm saying is here that the hyperfunctional versions will be in that space. And if you go into, um, let's say, a, an old retro style, you can still arrange things reasonably well, but we also knowing that you're quite hampered. So you will never be the winning scheme. You will be a so-so okay scheme, which could still be functionally better than a you know, totally, let's say, out of control uh, parametric creation. But I mean, all I'm saying is that the real, the, the best solutions must be found in the space of parametricism. Okay, maybe um, since we started late, I um, open up the conversation at this point. Right. So maybe I should stop sharing and then we can maybe discuss. Yeah. We already have um, questions from um, the YouTube and online, uh, two questions. Can you see the question? So where should I see the Q&A? Should I look at that? Yes, okay. the Q &A. yeah, exactly. We have two questions first, and then maybe followed okay. by the question. So this is uh, from Daniela Gatovici. Uh -huh. It's good. it's great to revisit AOA, meaning the Autopress of Architecture, now mm -hmm. converging with the discourse of freedom. Mm -hmm. How will radical innovation and in governance, economy, jurisprudence, that is through the blockchain, self-sovereignty and transparency, fuel the adaptation of radical innovation in the built environment? And the mainstream adoption of a hegemonic paradigm like parametrism in urban design, architecture, and all the design disciplines. How does Web3 and the metaverse fit into this convergence and mainstream adoption? Yeah, I think it's a good question. Basically, the way it fits in initially and most um, pertinently is that what I've witnessed that um, there is a great chance here when with the metaverse uh, so many new opportunities arrive for architects where many metaverses will be are under construction right now, but also so many, nearly every institution, whether university or museum or corporation, company, trade event, organizers, fairs, conferencing centers, everything um, is now... Um, art galleries in particular as well, of course, um, and social events for socializing of various types, they're all pressing into the metaverse. They have all finding, they all need versions of their venues, of their um, interaction scenarios in virtual spaces. So basically everybody who has a website now is, <laughs> is, is you know, at a particular, uh, um, likes to have some interaction with, with, with audiences and some service offering will end up in the metaverse. And that's an enormous opportunity for all architects. But I have the feeling, and that's what I perceive, that um, let's say digitally native operating architects, those who are versatile and fast with um, modeling software, with grasshopper, with generating intricate spaces quickly. And also when you have metaverse, you often procedurally can fill up whole, you know, metaverse urbanism, which I'm teaching right now at the AA. You mm -hmm. might have to do, you know, you know, do many iterations fast. And also those of us, you know, the, let's say the, the, the computationally savvy and engaged architects, we, we are the ones who have been using game engines for quite a while and we're familiar with 
bringing our projects into VR or into Unity or the Unreal Engine. And so, so that's what, in a sense what we have been doing at DRL and Zadid Architects. So we are incredibly, we have a fantastic advantage to be in there so fast. And it's a lot of ex student of mine as well. I can see it already in young architects. They can take over that space. And I think that's been very, very important. And I see it already happening. Um, and in particular, if you come there and you compete, you don't need a huge track record. You need, you know, you can build up that track record much faster. I think that this will be the the the, the moment now where parameters and tectonism will be um, will be dominating. Also, the agenda I've been talking about of phenomenology and semiology, the issue of navigation orientation. I mean, these spaces are largely visual orientation spaces. There's also, of course, ordering, but the, the semiology is playing a big role. So these themes will be coming in, but most importantly, I think I can see that, uh, and if that's happening, that parametricism, tectonism is taking over the metaverse largely or becomes a dominant force here, I think this will flow back. Because I believe that um, a lot of these companies will then also, when they have very successful venue and architecture in the virtual space, when they're thinking about upgrading or renovating or uh, doing some new projects in the uh, physical space, uh, then they would maybe use something similar or would, would like to see this affiliation. And so we also seeing that the clients of us who hear about that we are doing things in the metaverse, we are already many, many clients coming and wanting their buildings, we develop them as virtual buildings, they're coming to us also in China, by the way, <laughs> I don't wanna, it's still confidential, we, we're getting involved with metaverse projects. But I think this is a really, an, an, there's so much coming. I think that many of us, and uh, uh, should endorse it and we will we will take over that space we can do it and i think that will be a great opportunity to flow back i mean and, and the thing is this that of course in the metaverse the degrees of freedom are much more pertinent and, and real yes there will be in, in metaverses usually are very very non-restrictive uh, planning regimes right so it, it's much more it's much more cred it's much more likely that we get uh, much more um, innovative and experimental uh, solutions done there and you can change them quicker. Whereas in the real world and now we, we, have, we have so many restrictions, particular in Europe, in the more mature countries where planning regimes and land use plans and massing envelopes and densities and uh, use mixes are so prescribed that there's rarely a chance to do something different. So if you look at what's been built in London in the last 10 years, there's only one island where there's innovation, which is the city of London, uh, the financial center, which, but it's a very, very small nucleus of hyper innovation. And the rest is very sterile. It's literally you know, brick facades and, and and block filling and very, very uh, conservative and restrictive. And, and I think the metaverse is, is the space. Um, so, so thanks for the question. I think it's important. And I think we should all wake up for that. And it's really congenial. And I don't think it detracts because this is also, these are important. I mean, for me, metaverse is not a video game. It's, these are important space of engagement and I get a lot of requests we're hearing from you know universities wanting to do their virtual campus um, and this is serious serious work and I think it can integrate with physical spaces where we experience virtual spaces out of physical spaces with big panoramic screens or with and we have this overlay of AI uh, augmented reality into in, into physical space so, so we should embrace it as a, as a discipline. There's another question here. Um, you talked about the future and development of architecture, but what is our role as architects in the future of architecture? Well, are we going to be just operators of computation design software or we will have a different 
different making role in the future of architecture? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean here you're getting this kind of questions a lot. Of course, it's a creative act to, to develop a sophisticated design with computational tools. I mean, it, I mean, this is an intellectually more challenging operation than just doodling something on on with the pen and paper. So, it, you know, it is actually a, 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 a very sophisticated and also creative act to 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 develop intuitions and to let your systems generate for you many options but to first of all which options you you proliferate these are there's so many decisions even with the use of ai which is coming now which is is, is an amazing i think aid which can accelerate and potentiate our work i don't feel that it is taking away our work i've seen it over the of the in my career that we 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 became so much more productive through computational tools and it didn't mean that we reduced staff. It didn't even mean that there's less people working in the design disciplines, nor have the fees reduced. The opposite has taken place. So even though when I compare, and I was mentioned it the other day, um, when we started making doing competitions with, with hands, we only used computers for little for perspectives or something, the beginning or beginning, not at all. Uh, we had you know 10 people trying to draw plans of a competition uh, you know, for, for four weeks. And after we introduced uh, the computer also for the whole production of, this was in the early 90s, for, um, for the competition, I could, for instance, do all the plans myself in one week, what otherwise 10 people would have done in four weeks. Where, where this led to was not that now, you know, the, 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 the architectural industry is shrinking. It led to more demand, a much better anticipation for the client of a product more certainty on one had more versioning more realism in rendering bim more information about cost and geometric um, uh, coherency so it all went these empowerments meant that you know you simulate and much more you measure much more mature much more well um, calibrated decision uh, and, and then minimizing, first of all, that you built the, the mistake, mistakes like building the totally the wrong building, <laughs> uh, you know, regretfully because you didn't look at two, enough options and, op you know, obvious solutions were, were overlooked, but also you, you, without BIM, you have an enormous amount of change orders and delays in construction. You don't know, you know, in the end, uh, how your buildings function. So, so it's interesting that these productivity advances so far, they didn't go into diminishing the number of architects and, and or diminishing the fees through competition. They actually we, we living through this and seeing rising numbers of architects with rising fees and the percentage of value which is in design has increased massively. You know, so if you have a very sophisticated building like an opera house and so on, novel with, with complex novel building, you can expect the 15 to 20 percent of the value being in the in the design. And that makes a lot of sense because it generates so much efficiency and certainty and optimality. So and so so on that level, I wouldn't be afraid of any further automation. And all I feel is what these automation bring us, they allow us to increase the sophistication, certainty, and uh, search space and making the best decisions. So that when it comes to construction, we are actually know what we're doing and we're doing the best we could so and and uh, i just find the work you know you know always more thrilling with these new tools and it, it's fascinating it's challenging now with the dali 2 what i'm what you now makes possible and say wow now everybody can do this it's a great challenge for us to you know to to be remain competitive i, I so so i think that our role in as architects is only more empowered because we, we with these new tools, we can make a more momentous, more innovative, more, more, more um, spectacular impact on the built environment. Uh, whereas before we couldn't, you know, we could just do more or less what we've always done. And so I think with these new tools, but, and, and, you know, and we have to, by the way, because all other disciplines too, 
you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's actually architecture is behind in the sense that we are a small part of our discipline. Whereas if you look at the finance sector on the use of computational tools and algorithms, uh, it's, it's, it's all over the place in medicine with, 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 with IA diagnostics and, and tooling up uh, it, it, the whole profession and research science. So it's in a strange way we are, we are or in the, in the movie and media industry. So we actually behind and we, we should, anyway, I'm, I love the fact that we, uh, we can do much more impact. If you think about what Zah did architects, if I look back at the oeuvre, and it's not going to skim these lectures with hundreds of slides of complex buildings, very diverse and across the globe. I mean, it's unbelievable. I couldn't have imagined that I could represent something like this when I started, you know, breaking my back with an ink pen and trying to draw something. <laughs> it was like, so the sense of contributing and developing and being in charge, being creative, being somebody who is, who is delivering to the world creative is so much more empowered by all these uh, technologies. And of course, not as an individual, we have to build organizations and skill up workforce and inspire uh, colleagues and let their creative flour creativity flourish as well. So, so that's my feeling about it. Um, you know, no anxiety here. Of course, as a student, you have to that you have that steeper, <laughs> steeper learning curve. You know, you you have to go through the detour. You know, you can't just you have to you have to invest in this. It will also mean that uh, being a great architect becomes slightly more demanding. It maybe was a little bit too easy in the in these years of the Mavericks, inverted commas that it's become where architecture schools become like art schools and. You just follow your intuition. I think that's less, you know, we're gonna, we will draw into our field. Also, I think more, um, some of those who would otherwise maybe would have gone into science, would have gone into business um, uh, because they realize the excitement, the sophistication, the technology, the, the, the science and evidence-based character of our work. I think is appealing to another layer of young, bright students. And I think that's very important. Let's see if there's anything else. How can we make ourselves more compatible with changes in architecture? Well, that's, the, that's the thing, that's the anxiety, isn't it? You do, you, as architecture moves fast and you know, in particular, of course, for people um, who are brought up who, more traditionally, let's say, and um, the, I mean, they, they, they will have to shift. I mean, look, this is anyway what a lot of people do with age. Maybe there is harder for them to adapt. They can kind of uh, compete in the design of generating these beautiful designs. They move into, you know, administrative and business direction and project management. Some of these truth and experiences, you know, uh, 30, 30 year or 40 experience is extremely valuable. So, so that, you know, as the whole thing, as these companies grow and as, you know, the task of renovating the world. I mean, I was sometimes talking about the, the need to do the total, um, the, to, the remaking the physiognomy of the, of the, of the built environment of the planet in line with these new insights and dynamics, there's an enormous amount of work required. I mean, if I look at now what a lot of the suburbs of Mumbai, the way they're being built, that's the first stage coming out of shanty towns, let's say, and the similar in China, but these are not satisfying places. These are not cities, living with cities truly, where you have you know, a flock of 50 towers here, a flock of 50 towers over there with highways and no urban center. And no, so, so there is going to be remaking in the image. I mean, some of what's been built now is still built according to old paradigms. I don't think we're running out of work as affluence continues, productivity gains continue. People would want to have better lives. They would want to have more meaningful places to work and live and city textures they want to participate in. So I don't think we're running out of time out of work, uh, the, 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 the project of urbanization is not going to finish. 
And I already can see that what they've been building, you know, let's say 20 years in China go, they're now, you know, now they have to demolish and rebuild that. And similarly in Europe, and this happened in Europe as well. I mean, this, there was a total remake and makeover. Um, and I think that's, that, that's important to realize because the built environment, you know, we're, we, we're talking about metaverse and physical existence. That's going to be very important. But ultimately, we, we, we always all, <laughs> we'll never lose our step out of our body. We always need that physical environment too. And I think it will fuse with augmented reality and, and virtual. So, so I think this has an enormous importance because if you think about it, once you've crossed a certain affluence threshold, as let's say a professional or as somebody, a middle-class affluence, and it's not just about, you know, sh the sheer survival with, with food, shelter, clothing, and so on. The, what really expresses your, your level of happiness and well-being is the living, the environments you can live in, where you work, where you live, the community, the spaces. So, so and there's never enough of that. I mean, you don't want to have more than one or two or three cars, uh, or you you can't eat tape, ten steaks, <laughs> but there was the 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 upgrading of your built environment is an infinite project, and that's why I think uh, we're in the right. I mean, we wouldn't have to worry about um, um, even with the, the the most productive tooling. I think there will always be this effect, as I said earlier, that that's that's the infinite project of making the planet a beautiful light-footed, elegant, pleasurable home where we as architects will always be a, a critical contributor. Great. Maybe, uh, Patrick, I have some questions for you. Uh, for your, okay, yes, uh, please. Lecture. I think it's great, uh, great, fantastic opening uh, for the six lectures. I think why we invite Patrick coming to make six lectures this year is because we want to like uh, review the past 15 years. I think uh, that's 2008, you published, you put forward parametricism and it's more like a review on your, uh, your, 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 your theory and uh, to rethinking today, probably on the, the new framework for architecture, I think, uh, which is the theoretical background, how you raise this problem. I think, um, uh, you're teaching fantastic studio in uh, ADRL, I think, uh, which also parallel with your thinking, which is um, um, uh, raising up, I think, is uh, falling by a lot of um, uh, criticize and uh, crit critics to your theory at the very beginning. I think uh, which uh, today you, you probably make a brief introduction on the mainly it's a convergence of the social, uh, uh, social networks and social behaviors, and you want to find a unified theory, uh, maybe a comprehensive, uh, pre comprehensive theory to represent uh, uh, the, the social networks uh, uh, you actually define. So we want to, um, uh, could you briefly uh, give us some uh, introduction because this is the first lecture, uh, we, uh, you, you not mentioned too much on autopiosis, a poesis, the title of uh, this is automation uh, of the, the 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 architecture and the social behavior. So, could you introduce the background and some teaching and uh, a studio research at that time? That's around fifteen years ago in ADRL, and also how uh, uh, would you like to address this theory into the the social progress uh, fifteen years ago? I think uh, that's a the question. And secondly, I think. Um, to me, it's more like a stu uh, formalism. Uh, you raise um, the parametrism. It's, it's a certain kind of uh, geometry strategy to present uh, the complexity and try to unify this comp social complexity and systems, uh, including the system of communication, including the system of social behaviors, uh, to a certain kind of geometrical representation uh, of the city of the architecture. And um, uh, do you think uh, the autopiosis should be only represented by such kind of ways 
uh, from the uh, right now everyone mentioned the data science of the social progress and also include the virtual and the physical uh, representation of the social progress. So how would you like to address autopiosis in such kind of uh, virtual metaverse today? So it's more like uh, 15 years before and today, uh, could you make some comparison analysis on uh, the background and uh, uh, these uh, 15 years transformation to your theory? Could you just give a review and comparison on that? Yes. Yeah, yeah, thanks a lot for the question. I mean, actually, when uh, when parametricism started before I called it parametricism in the early 90s under folding, and there was a, an interesting slogan. It, it, it tried to demarcate itself strongly from deconstructivism. And uh, it also put together retrospectively deconstructivism and postmodernism together. and then in a sense, uh, castigated deconstructism and postmodernism in terms of being interested in representation and uh, looking at it as some kind of linguistic um, paradigm. And uh, so the slogan was performance rather than representation or performance versus representation. That was a big slogan. And where that led to that the early parametrism or folding these kind of projects were looking at infrastructure projects of projects of flow of fluidity uh, of, of complex layering. So this uh, same thing like the typical project would be, I mean, actually we at DOL, we also went into, you know, let's say designing airports or the in-studio Arnheim station. Um, um, if, we had, you know, FOA with the with the ferry terminal. These were the paradigmatic projects. They were performance based in a in a straightforward way, and they don't seem to call for any form of representation. Now, uh, my when I came later and I started to to write, and when I started to formulate my theory of the autopistes of architecture, I was actually um, was trying to shift away from that contrast. I think it's a false contrast. Um, I would rather say uh, not performance rather than representation or performance versus representation, I would say represent <coughs> performance through representation. Now, when I look at my theory of architecture, the performance part, yes, it does have this element of organization, which was emphasized. The complexity of organization, which was emphasized first where you how you place things and the idea of open a single surface for instance that you can that you have multiple levels connected and integrated this is organizational these are physical connections maybe in, in, even visual but it wasn't so much looked at connections or organ organizing something where you have a, a gradient transformation was an organizational principle you know it says a zone a and then a zone b but we have zone a and then we have some interim zones which gradually transform into zone B. So these could still be discussed as organizational elements. And it was about, um, in particular, when it comes to this infrastructure project, it was about the efficiencies of flows of performance. And this, you know, so, so, but I thought, no, well, yes, you need these elements of organization, but the organization only works if it is also becoming self-transparent to the end users. We are not, you know, if you model an agent, yes, you can model it. You're not vehicles on autopilot, or we don't have a transparent model of the built environment in our computer and can just, you know, uh, teleport to everybody. We actually require to understand, in particular, a complex environment becomes a problem we need to understand where things might be, how, where a path continues or what I'm confronted with, particularly when you're talking about um, folding an architecture or even in deconstructism, you're very abstract and unusual forms, which you now think they fit well to certain functions. But if I'm not understanding them, I can't find them, use them, and don't know what I'm doing here. So, the, it was clear to me that this idea of representation, as well as the perceptual tractability, first of all, which I call the phenomenological project, 
as well as the semi-logical project where there's an there's a learned and communicated understanding of what is where and what's going on is a part of the overall performance project in terms of so societal performance, social performance. Not so much, of course, technical performance is, is irrespective of representation. That's pure physics, but the social performance isn't. So that, that's one of the starting points where I'll start to realize when I'm, when I'm um, uh, rehearsing and reflecting on uh, what has been achieved in the previous 10 years, for instance, in, uh, or 15 years, uh, when I was writing, uh, starting to write the Oedipus of Architecture, we already uh, 15 years nearly into um, the, the, the process of developing that new paradigm. That was one of the things where I want to make a mark on to uh, advance further. And I think this part is, hasn't been picked up so much. Um, and it's interestingly that this part is serviced well by tectonism because it gets a more a richer variety of recognizable features when you can distinguish different types of curvature uh, based on you know, uh, tensile anticlastic versus compression only, synclastic versus inflatable versus uh, ruled surfaces. They're all, we're all sensitive. They could all mean different things. We can employ them. So tectonism is a richer, semiological project. So I'm still trying to teach this, trying to work on this, trying to bring us forward. And I think the metaverse would help me to make that even more clear. So there's one of the one of the things which I where I added something to the project, which actually was because I wasn't buying into that stark contrast. Actually I'm adding something in an instrumental way which was existed in postmodernism and deconstructivism as an interest, but actually not so instrumental. Anyway, so that's one thing I wanted to say. Now, when it comes to the use, this idea of the way I define parametricism at the time, and it's what is interesting for me to recognize, it's very stable. I can fully commit to what I've been saying at the time. And when I wrote it at the time, I realized it was already committed to in practice for 15 years. So it's a very long trajectory because we're living in that historical era of post fordism with these new dynamics, with these new let's say important uh, uh, winning attributes, network effects, networking, connecting, openness, simultaneity and, um, and, and you know, multitasking and, and being part of many networks at the same time. All these themes, they only have gotten more intensive. And I think the, the historical, let's say, truth or historic, I mean, it's maybe not the right word, the historical pertinence and well adaptedness of the paradigm uh, has, I think, only been strengthened. And I think that's coming through. So I'm very happy with this. But when you're talking about, yes, I am focusing on the one hand, because that's what we work with. We work ultimately our instrument as forms, right? We, you can say, and it's important that we are sensitive to formalisms, that we recognize different systems of forms, but obviously they're not, they're not an end of themselves. They're just a tool. So if we expand the repertoire of formal possibilities, we are expanding the toolbox. It's a repertoire of solutions. So it's a, it's, it's, it, and, and when I'm describing the parametricism uh, paradigm and it's a heuristics and, and the, the, I'm actually always contrasting and placing next to each other what I call the formal heuristics both in terms of negative, what we're no longer doing and what we're now always doing with the functional heuristics, because what this is matching up with the new sensibility of understanding societal function, the way buildings function. So, so when I'm talking about, um, for instance, when you're talking about we, that we're rejecting um, a hermetic discrete primitives like cubes, spheres, and triangles, you know, we, 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 we also rejecting very discrete stereotype social conditions. You know, uh, uh, we, we, we actually, so we, these on the, and when we then say we, we're rejecting simple repetition, uh, we also in, in, in society, in, in, in programmatic terms, we, 
we, we, we don't have fine briefs where they ask us to repeat something 500 times, where we want this and positively, everything needs to be differentiated. Every system needs to be varied and differentiated. That's also what we're thinking of in terms of social conditions. And we have also in betweening and social, social conditions as we have in the forms. And then the final one also when you say, in terms of what a, a big topic in the correlating systems, that they're not just juxtaposed and collaged, but that they connect and resonate and inflect each other. And that's in the same with spaces. Every subsidiary social, let's say, subsystem or space communicates with many others. So they need to they need to adapt to each other, relative to each other, and they need to form some kind of synthesis. So so I'm very for me it's very important that although we what is initially foregrounded and and that becomes tangible, memorable, and you can point to and make diagrams of is the formal heuristics and the, that's what comes to be seen as let's say the visual spatial, stylistic, and morphological stylistic characteristics or principles. And uh, sorry, I'm somehow fear black. <laughs> and, uh, but, but this is thought through is with respect to, you know, the 21st century has a different attitude to, to, to the social function to the brief. You know, we have parametrically variable event scenarios rather than stereotypical um, rooms, which you can just ask the question, how big and where to put. We the, each 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 in the form of room or zone is a uniquely parametrically calibrated entity uh, on the side of societal function, a brief side. So so and that's obviously that's why the brief writing itself also has to evolve. And and brief writing oftentimes is is as a process with clients, in fact. And we've seen that the first time we saw that very, very deeply was when we did the BMW central building. There wasn't a schedule of accommodation where we had, it was clear what everything is and we just have to place it in the right place in the right size. But we had to tease out with multiple user groups and representatives of the company, what they were looking for, what the performance and connections and the aspirations of the space would be. And it became this kind of multi-parameter emergent things so so and then we're trying now to simulate when we're doing when i'm now saying what's the program and functionality how am i representing this in the old days i just write you know i just write foyer or i just write uh, um, boardroom and now in the current world we're actually running an agent simulation inside the space and that's the way we represent to ourselves and test you know uh, and we can't just look and say yes that looks like a boardroom that is a boardroom you know? <laughs> and i can draw a table and so so that's the big difference so in and the, the latest stage what i was what i was just at volume two at the end of volume two i realized wow i this idea of agent simulations could be the way to operationalize it's the semiological project that's i gladly before editorial closure i could put one sentence in but that's what i've been working on since so so that's where what i think is satisfying about the the theoretical edifice it is very robust first of all why because it comes 15 years in I'd already written 100 articles, which I'm now trying to, in a lot of ideas, systematize and read through in a long project. And then it gave me a lot of ideas of what to work on next. And it, looking back at it, I don't have to revise much of what stands there. It was quite a good recipe and good guide for the, for the next 15 years of work, which we're still working on. The radical new thing is now the metaverse. And, and I think, um, that um, it probably will, re, re, you know, there are some new new aspects. The dynamism, which I've been working on since, of, of interactive real-time and self-transforming, basically robotic in, in architectures will be there very prominently. And, and that is not so much reflected in the, in the two volumes yet, but that's been an article since. So I think um, uh, that's why I am considering writing a third volume, which I call the new 
practice for architecture. So volume one is a new framework for architecture. Volume two is a new agenda for architecture, which is things like the organizational project, the phonology project, the semiological project. And now it's a new practice for architecture where, where we'll have the, these new suites of tools like the agent-based life process modeling, like, uh, and, and what we're now developing in terms of metaverse uh, integration, uh, the cyber urban incubator, things like this. These were new practices of architecture. I might, but I'm not sure when I should start writing because things are so in flux. So I think I'm gonna do a few more articles um, uh, before I'm trying to, to wrap that up as a cornerstone. I give myself a few more years. Great. Uh, we have a lot, a lot of questions, but I think uh, we still have five more days. And maybe just okay, later by okay, yeah. let's do that. Let's do that. <laughs> we, have, we, we want to make discuss with you um, tomorrow uh, and welcome all the students back. And also, we have uh, a lot of, of audience um, uh, uh, on Bitabili and YouTube. And welcome, join us in different discussion. You can put forward everything on YouTube, and uh, tomorrow we can also keep make discussion with Patrick. I think um, Patrick have a profound, profound thinking, uh, but actually also a lot of criticize for your uh, research practice. But I think uh, um, uh, people also make discussion on the super successful, not only for your uh, theoretical profound thinking, but also to run the, the, the Jaha office so uh, successful, especially in, in China, I think. Um, Maybe uh, some social background and the understanding of that reading into the social practice, practice is important uh, to showing your, uh, your, your thinking and your theory and your design will have a very strong uh, corresponding relationship with the social progress over the past 20 or 15 years. So welcome back. Uh, uh, looking forward to thank having you, you tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> Patrick, okay, thank great. you so much. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think today we have a bye bye. Bye, bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.